Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled, Karen hit my car with her truck on purpose, crashed me. Uno reverse card revenge. I had always felt proud of my old car, even though it had seen better days. It was a car I had bought almost 10 years ago, when I was still a teenager. Now, in my mid-twenties, the car had aged quite a bit, but I had spent enough time fixing it up that it still ran well, and I didn't mind that it was considered a junk car. Sure, it wasn't the prettiest thing to look at, but it was mine. Living in a rented out place meant that I had to park my car on the street, as I didn't have a garage or a driveway to park it in. Usually, I parked closer to my neighbor's side of the street, which had never been an issue until recently. My neighbor, Karen, always leaving for work in her shiny new truck, which she kept meticulously clean. She thought she owned the street, and she was not happy that I parked my old car there, making it a little more difficult for her to back out of her driveway. I tried to accommodate her, moving my car back further, but she was still unhappy, and things only got worse from there. She didn't want me to park on the street at all, and I didn't want to park on the lawn, so we were at a stalemate. It was clear that she had a problem with me, but I had no idea how much he resented me until one weekend when I was sitting on my fire escape. Out of the blue, my neighbor hit my parked car with her truck, and it was obvious that it wasn't an accident. I immediately started recording, and I was able to capture enough footage of her truck hitting my car to prove that it was intentional. I was in shock, but I knew I had to do something about it. I filed an insurance claim, and to my surprise, I was awarded a payout of $1,600. It felt like a small victory, but it was satisfying to know that my neighbor was fuming about it. My landlord had also heard about the incident and had told my neighbor to stay off his property. But it turned out that this wasn't the end of the story. A few weeks later, I received a knock on my door from a police officer. He informed me that my neighbor had been arrested for a hit-and-run accident, and that she had hit another car while driving under the influence of alcohol. The driver of the other car was in critical condition. I couldn't believe it. The same person who had purposefully hit my car was now responsible for hurting someone else. It was a sobering reminder that actions have consequences, and sometimes, karma takes its time to catch up. Update. A year had passed since the incident, and I had moved to a new city for a job opportunity. I had sold my old car, which had served me well but was now a reminder of the past. I was still in touch with my old landlord, who informed me that my neighbor had lost her job and was facing criminal charges for the hit and run accident. It was a stark reminder that even when someone seems to have it all, they can still be brought down by their own poor decisions. I was glad to have moved on, but I couldn't help but feel a little sad for my old neighbor. The next story is titled, Working in the Yard, I live in a consolidated county. That means that the city and county governments merged some years back, ostensibly to reduce administrative and infrastructure costs. This is important, because services like fire, police, utilities, and trash pickup are now managed by former county officials, and not the city officials. Many of these services are also much more inefficient, and some services have been outsourced to private companies. My municipality outsourced trash and yard waste pickup a few years ago, and the two companies who now do those collections are woefully inadequate, and their services cost more than when the city or county did it. They both have similar sets of rules what can be put out for collection, take fewer types of waste away, and no longer come two days a week as the city once did, but now only come one day a week. We're all paying more money for less service. Now that the background is done, here's the story. I did some yard work over the course of a couple of weekends last summer, cutting some limbs, trimming some shrubbery, and cutting down a dead tree in my backyard. Knowing what the rules are for how much yard waste, limbs, leaves, and such can be put out, I bagged everything that was supposed to be bagged, filling up three of them. Things like leaves and small clippings, weeds, and such. The paper bags for yard waste from the big box home improvement stores are what they require, so I use those. I just fill them halfway up so as to not make them too heavy for the waste collectors, even though there are no written weight restrictions. However, if a bag is too full, they will knock it over to spill out the contents, so they then don't have to pick it up. I cut the larger limbs down to under 4 feet in length, or they wouldn't be picked up. 
Anything at all they can do to get out of picking something up, they will do. And they almost always leave a horrendous mess behind when they do pick things up. The pile put out for collection is not allowed to be any wider than 10 feet, nor any deeper or higher than 5 feet, nor may it contain any piece longer than 4 feet. All bags must be placed in a row, no more than 3 feet away from the limb pile. My pile was maybe 4 inches longer than the 10 feet, and only because of the tiny ends of the limbs, smaller than a toothpick, hanging out of the pile. The pile was no higher than 3 feet, and no deeper than 4 feet. In other words, it fell within the size limits, except for a few twigs with leaves. I also had the three bags, each about half full of clippings and leaves, all lined up exactly as required, and about two feet away from the main pile. They were scheduled to come on a Tuesday, but when I got home from work that afternoon, it was all still there. There was a pre-printed notice on my door that my pickup exceeded the proscribed size limits, and the note said that I would be required to either pay a $250 oversize load fee, or, reduce the size of the pile by half, to make it fit into the limit. This is where the malicious compliance comes in. I had the next two days off, so the next morning, bright and early, I got out the hedge trimmers. I trimmed the ends of the pile back to exactly 9 feet in length. After carefully laying those trimmed bits on top of the pile, I went to the backyard, where the limbs I had not trimmed up the week before were stacked for the following week's pile, and found four long, fairly straight limbs. I removed all the smaller limbs and leaves from these limbs, ending up with four moderately straight poles, each about seven feet long. I marked one-foot intervals on each pole in fluorescent orange paint, and stuck them in the ground, out at the curb in the front yard, at the corners of a rectangle exactly 5 feet wide and 10 feet long. Got out the surveyor's tape, bright pink plastic tape used to mark property corners, and tied it onto and around the stakes at the height of 5 feet. This established a visual outline of the volume 1 was required to stay within. I made absolutely sure that everything in the pile was completely inside the poles and below 5 feet in height. This required adding almost two-thirds of the remaining pile in the backyard to the stack out front, to bring it up to 4 feet 6 inches in width, 4 feet 6 inches in depth, and 9 feet 6 inches in length. And no pieces longer than 46 inches. The pile was almost twice as much material as before. This included some small logs, up to 4 inches in diameter, also each 46 inches long. The limit is 5 inches diameter. All within the limits of 5 feet by 5 feet by 10 feet the waste company mandates. I carried each of the three bags of clippings to the backyard and filled each of them up as much as possible, while still being able to fold over the tops and staple shut each bag. I also included small, 8 inches to 10 inches sections of the ends of larger limbs, for added weight. The bags were now completely filled and weighed more than twice what they had before. I had to use the hand truck to get them out to the curb, they were so heavy. Oh, and all the extra clippings I had generated, filled up two more bags, so the total was now five bags. The company limit. I then went inside, called the company, and very nicely asked that they come to pick up my yard waste, since they had not done so on Tuesday. They agreed to send out a truck and crew and told me I would have to pay the fee. Come on then, I told them. They soon arrived, and happened to be the same crew that normally comes to my neighborhood. I pulled a 25-foot Stanley tape measure from my pocket, and asked them to measure the poles, to confirm that the space was within the required limits. They did so, and agreed the pile was not oversized, and proceeded to spend the next two hours manually loading it all onto their truck. Oh, and it took both of them to manhandle each of those bags into the back of the truck too. I told them, very nicely and with a smile, that I knew what 10 feet was, pointed to the fence where it was marked with orange electrical tape, and thanked them for coming to pick up my yard waste, the two tired, sweaty waste disposal guys just groaned, got in their truck, and drove off. There was no extra fee added to my bill for that month. Never has been since. Now, I know they got paid for their time, and I know that I had to do a lot of extra work on my day off, but since last July, I have not once ever had them leave so much as a single leaf on the ground in front of my house. They had to actually do some hard work, with me standing there in shorts, smiling and drinking cold Gatorade while they were sweating. The next story is titled, Woman blocks her sidewalk with a car, asks us to call the police. My neighbor blocked the sidewalk with her car during the last two snowstorms. This meant, one, so she claims, she didn't have to shovel a path from her car to her house and instead was able to step directly on her shoveled sidewalk, which she pays someone to shovel, 
and could then walk to her front door and, two, she didn't need to shovel the sidewalk that her car blocked because no snow landed there and, three, she didn't shovel the sidewalk between her car and the edge of her property, about two feet, because once people have to walk around her car in the street, who cares about the last couple of feet? She shoveled the sidewalk until her the driver's side of the car, but not the passenger's side. So, my wife politely knocked on her door, explained that forcing our kids to walk around her car meant they walked in the street and that wasn't safe. Therefore could she please drive her car fully into her driveway, as required by law? The law doesn't permit someone to block a sidewalk. We didn't want to make this into a big deal, but as neighbors asked if she could be a normal human. The woman said no, then claimed it wasn't safe for her to pull at the way into her driveway because that would force her to step in snow. My wife said if that was a concern, she should shovel a path on her grass from her driveway to her front door. The woman then claimed she is not feeling well. My wife pointed out that she did this two months ago during the last snowstorm and that she goes to work daily. If she really was sick, she'd be stuck in the house. Additionally, not feeling well doesn't preclude a person from parking in their own driveway or walking in snow. My wife said she would call the police, non-emergency line. The neighbor says, go ahead, and she'd get a doctor's note. So, we did. The police said they would drive over. We didn't see whether the police chatted with her or not. Either way, she got a ticket for blocking the sidewalk. She did shovel the two feet of sidewalk. I suspect the police did speak to her and reminded her that not shoveling a sidewalk is a fine from the building department, not the police, and if we were willing to call the police, we'd probably call the building department too. We had planned on it, but they were closed on the weekend when this happened. She now pulled further up, still partially blocking the sidewalk, but at least we don't need to walk around in the street. Of course, if she does this again, we won't be asking her politely to move the car and we'll call the police instead. Not that entertaining, but ask us to call the police, happy to. Edit. To avoid confusion and because I didn't explain well, the police deal with a car that is blocking a sidewalk. The building department deals with a sidewalk that isn't shoveled. We care more about blocking the sidewalk although shoveling the snow would be nice too. She shoveled the remaining portion of the sidewalk after getting a ticket for blocking the sidewalk with her car. The last story is titled, Uncle lived near an HOA. My uncle bought a piece of land and built his house on it several years later several houses were made around him and an HOA was formed he never joined it because he hated the idea of HOAs. The whole problem started when my uncle saw several kids playing in his backyard now my uncle has seven dogs two are bloodhounds one was a pit bull and the rest were mutts so he was worried that the kids might get bitten by a dog. He built a fence around the border of his land it took him three days to finish however the day after he finished. He gets a fine from the HOA for building the fence without the permission of the HOA. He ignores it since he is not part of the HOA and the fence is on his land and was not breaking in rules. A week later someone from the HOA comes to talk to him about the fence and he says he is not paying the fine because he is not part of the HOA and he then explains why he built the fence. The HOA apparently thought he had one dog and not seven. My uncle says goodbye thinking they had come to an agreement that the fence was fine. But my uncle would paint it, which he already planned to do he had just not gotten around to it. The next day however he gets several fines one of which was for his dogs and another was for the fence he again ignored it again. Several days later he buys two white paint cans and starts to paint the fence however while he is doing it several people that live there walked by some said hi others just glared at him as they walked by. He paid them no mind and after a while several people from the HOA came by to complain about the color he chose he didn't understand what was wrong after all it was white. So, he asks what was wrong with it and they said they didn't approve him building the fence yet alone painting it and they proceeded to say that he has to tear down the whole fence by the end of the week and then request for permission to build the fence again. He refuses and says again that he was not part of the HOA. This turns into an argument where his dogs are brought up and by the end of it, they were threatening his dogs by this point there was a small crowd gathering watching so my uncle calms himself down picks up his paint and goes back home. Three days later while he was walking around the inside of the fence, he finds several pieces of bacon covered in a white powder. When he picked them up, he realized they smelled like a chemical and he realized that someone was trying to poison his dogs. Getting super pissed he installs several cameras around the fence to find out who it was, and he actually gets them on camera one night. So he goes to the HOA's meeting that was happening next month, but when he gets there it turned out that the person trying to poison his dogs was the HOA's president who, 
I will call her Karen. He hadn't even met it until then. He still showed the video and even brought some of the bacon as proof and said that if it continued he would contact the police. After that the bacon stopped being thrown into his yard and she was voted out and later moved somewhere else. It wasn't until a month after the Karen moved that he was told the kids he saw playing in his yard were the Karen's kids and that since he built the fence, they had been complaining non-stop for months that they could no longer play there. My uncle only didn't call the cops immediately because he had some bad run-ins with them when he was younger and didn't trust them to not screw him over. Thank you for listening.